so let's resume. And so I'm very happy to have to follow up with you. Thank you very much. Um, I am very grateful to the organizers for this invitation. Um, it's a wonderful occasion. And um, you know, first of all, my you know best wishes to Eberhard for this uh, 80th birthday. And I want to thank him for everything he has done. But uh, not only for me, because I think there is a real uh, Knobloch network around, <laughs> which uh, unites a lot of us. And that's the pleasure of, uh, I don't, don't want to call it a gang or something, but it's, uh, it's a network. And uh, you know, this is a great occasion, because some of that network, in fact, is here. I remember when Ladislav came to Berkeley, and I advised him to get in touch with Eberhard so that, you know, uh, he started another chain of uh, contacts. So for all of that, thank you very much, Eberhard. So, let's see if we can, this working here. Okay, so we've done quite a bit. I want to talk about Robert Gross's test. Um, this is part of some recent work I've been doing. Um, I have a book coming out with uh, Oxford University Press, which is a combination of history of early uh, medieval philosophy, 13th century, early 13th century, and then contemporary mathematics. It's kind of a strange hybrid. Um, but uh, you know, I wanted to focus on a specific problem, possibly giving you a specific answer for a puzzle uh, in which I ran into. So Robert Gross's test. Uh, 1175, 1253 is one of the most important philosophers of the first half of the 20th century. He was Bishop of Lincoln from 1235 to 1253. He was also a pivotal thinker in the transmission of Aristotelian thought in the West. He wrote the first commentary in the Latin, in the Latin West of the posterior analytics and arguably the first commentary on Aristotle's physics. So, he was also a big student of nature, as well as a theologian. Now, in describing Robert Rossett's treatise, De Luce, James McEvoy wrote, I do not know of any other work of the same character dating from medieval times, and I regard it as the original creation of a bold and powerful mind that had arrived at its fullest maturity. And he surely intended to include as part of this striking originality of the treatise, gross attest reflections on unequal infinites, uh, which I should say are <coughs> the first ones in the Latin West. For he wrote, likewise, his argument invoking mathematical infinity and relative infinities seems to have been his own invention, at least so far as our present knowledge goes. And this is still, in fact, true. Despite their importance, Grosset's passages on unequal infinities have given rise to few but conflicting interpretations. So my goal in this paper is to discuss a controversial passage from De Luce to interpret and evaluate the different interpretations and to propose my own solution to some of the difficulties. All the passages I will cite will be in English in the slides, but the handout as all the original Latin, which is important because some of the things really depend on uh, issues of uh, philology, and uh, this is why I also thought this was uh, a good thing to honor Eberhard. <laughs> so, in the Luce, Grossa test, I'll keep saying the Luce, which is the Italian way you know, of pronouncing Latin since the uh, Renaissance. Uh, Giordano Bruno was made great fun of when he went to Oxford because he's saying things like, Chircini instead of Kirchini, the way they would say it. Uh, but I'll, I'll keep to that. So Grossetes proposes a daring cosmological theory in which every body is the result of the multiplication of an unextended or dimensionless point of light. In order to rebut the Aristotelian objections concerning the impossibility of constituting bodies from points, Grossetes declares that the objection only applies to finite multiplication of a point of light. But it has no force when one takes into consideration the possibility of an infinite multiplication of a point of light. And in order to explain then how different bodies, finite bodies, can 
have different sizes, Brosset test is like to postulate that the primordial point of light can be infinitely multiplied according to different infinities. And so we are in the realm so far of physics and cosmology. But in order to persuade these readers, Brosset test also tries to explain the possibility of different infinite multiplications by giving examples from mathematics. And the aim of the examples is to show that the infinities can come in different sizes. The importance of these passages cannot be exaggerated. Grosseter seems to have been the first medieval Latin author to have put forth a positive account of unequal infinities. So let's look at the section where Grosseter tells us something about these infinities. This is the passage you have the Latin in the uh, handout. Now, it is possible that an infinite sum, and he uses aggregatio, which I'm going to translate sum, although there, there, there would be a long story to tell about the aggregatio too, but let's just leave it as sum, uh, of numbers tends to an infinite sum in every numerical ratio and even in every non-numerical ratio. And some infinites are more than others, and others less than others. Thus, the sum of all numbers both odd and even is infinite and is greater than the sum of all the even numbers, even though this too is infinite, for it exceeds it by the sum of all the odd numbers. <laughs> the sum of all numbers proceeding without break from unity by doubling. This is going to be a key sentence, I'm going to read it, because a uh, key phrase for what we need to do. Omnium numerorum ab unitate continue duplorum. For a while, I was going to bed reciting this in my mind. It's also infinite, as two is the sum of all the numbers corresponding to those doubles as their halves. And yet, the sum of the halves must be half the sum of their doubles. In the same way, the sum of all numbers preceding without break from unity by tripling, continue at triplorum, is triple the sum of all the thirds corresponding to those triples. The same clearly holds for numerical ratios of every kind, since one infant can stand to another <laughs> infant in any one of these ratios. Let me close this preliminary part with a terminological remark. Grosseter speaks of infinite number as standing in every proportion, numerical and non-numerical. What he means is that, in the first case, is that the proportion between two infinite numbers A and B is as that of two natural numbers N and M. And in the second case, that the proportion cannot be so expressed as in the case of the ratio between the side, for instance, as it might happen when you have the ratio between the side and the diagonal of the square. But here, one should speak of commensurable <coughs> and incommensurable ratios. The tendency of commentators to parse what Brodsky test is saying by appeal to rational any rational numbers uh, can lead to a very inaccurate reading. So, but I will not pursue this particular issue. I just want to fly it. Now, the Luce is not a text that was widely read, and even when it was read, it was not the part on the infinite numbers that drew the attention of the commentators. Occasional remarks on the passage on mathematical infinity, for instance, we can find them in Orem, merely restated Grosseter's text. So a remarkable fact about this passage is from Meluccia is that um, there seems to be no real attempt at explicating what is going on with them between the 13th century and the 20th century. So the only useful interpretations of, of Grosseter's passages here we need to consider are those that originate from 20th century commentators. And we now turn to them. So the first one is Ludwig Bauer, who was the editor of Grosseter's work and in many ways responsible for the revival of interest in Grosseter's. Um, Bauer made the following comment on Grosseter's claim that infinite numbers exhibit proportional relations just as finite numbers do. He says, the series of the even and that of the odd numbers are infinite, 
but that of the even is greater by one. Anything else going on? Here. Uh, anyway, we keep going. Or the infinite series of numbers that come about through geometrical progression by doubling or tripling are greater than the infinite series that come about through iterated halving or division by three. This is just as much as Bauer says about this. And we will see that, you know, it really makes no sense of the first part of what Grosseteste is claiming, and other commentators have pointed this out. This audience doesn't need an introduction to arithmetical and geometrical progression, so let me just quickly run through them, but um, you know, I want to start with the finite truncation up to n of a series originating from an arithmetical progression as the form uh, summation i up to n of a plus i minus 1 times d, where a is the starting value, n is the number of elements being summed, and d is the constant distance between the elements. The value of the finite truncation is given by that formula, and so in the case of natural numbers, and even numbers and odd numbers, we can get those uh, sequences um, by means <coughs> of using a equals uh, 1 and d equals 1 for the natural numbers, a equals 2 and d equals 2 for the even numbers, and then for the odd numbers, a equals 1 and d equals 2. So this infinite series, I say, originate from arithmetical progressions. By contrast, in a geometrical progression, we have this form that the ith member is given by some starting point a1, multiplied by uh, the ratio r to the i minus 1. Again, we have a formula for computing the geometrical progression. And so, for instance, if a equals 1 and r equals 3, we have 1, 3, 9, 27, and so on. Um, if we start uh, with a ratio of 2, we get 1, 2, 4, 8. Um, but then another geometrical progression that is really important is the one that starts from Uh, is the one that starts without the one that starts at two, and we'll see why that is important. Now, Bauer claimed that by aggregatio, omnio numerorum ab unitate continue duplorum, Grosseteste was referring to geometrical progressions. This is the only valuable element of his interpretation. The first part about you know the you know the even are greater by one and so on, it's really nonsensical. But we'll see that this intuition that in fact it was a geometrical progression that was at issue here is a, uh, an important one. But Grosseteste's text is not perspicuous here, and we need to do quite a bit of work uh, to see whether he really meant to talk about series originating from an arithmetical <coughs> or a geometrical progression, uh, which is a contested point of interpretation. So whether Bauer, Bauer was correct in interpreting Grosseteste uh, in this way requires part of discussion. And the next two important commentators in this story are Birkenmeier and McEvoy. Um, by contrast to Bauer, they think that what um, Grosseteste is talking about is arithmetical progressions, not geometrical ones. So Alexander Birkenmeier in 1948 summarized uh, Grosseteste's claims on infinity as follows. He um, says, the conclusion is prepared by a whole series of mathematical statements, and then he says, which natural not to be judged from the standpoint of algebra, nor from that of Cantor's theory of sets, which in modern symbols would take the following form, using the summation sign for uh, up to, uh, to infinity, so first claim, the proportion of sigma a over sigma b can be any rational or irrational number. The sum of all the natural numbers is strictly greater than the sum of the even numbers. And then the sum of the even numbers is two times the sum of the natural numbers. I'm going to skip the because it's related to issues of irrationality that I don't want to discuss right now. So that's the interpretation. And this is what Grosseteste is claiming. Of course, one, that the proportion can be rational or irrational, is really the end point of the whole argument, because then 
it gets lifted to the cosmology. He has to show that bodies can have different sizes because there are these different sizes of infinities. But let's say something about B. There's something really awkward in giving an equivalence as one of gross Testis claims. So the equivalence is that um, B says <coughs> that sigma n over, uh, is greater than, uh, so the, the sum of the natural numbers is strictly greater than the sum of the even numbers if and only if, so it's equivalent to, that's the claim, to the result that if you subtract from the sum of the natural numbers, the sum of the even numbers, you get the sum of the odd numbers. So he's giving this equivalence as capturing what Grossa test has been saying. But there is something really awkward about giving an equivalence as this one for Grossa test claim. First of all, one can object to the validity of the equivalence. Assume that the sum of the natural numbers is strictly greater than the sum of the even numbers. Well, it still doesn't follow that when you take right the uh, so when you take uh, the uh, difference between the natural numbers and the even numbers, what you get is exactly the sum of the even numbers. In fact, it is easy to find a counterexample to this sort of inference, even by grosser test slides. By contrast, the other direction holds. If you have <coughs> that uh, the um, um, the sum of the natural numbers is strictly greater than the um, uh, sorry sorry that the sum of the natural numbers is strictly greater than the sum of the even numbers does follow from the fact that when you subtract from the natural the sum of the natural numbers when you subtract the sum of the even numbers they should get the sum of the odd numbers from that you can get back to here but you can get from here to there. So that's the first thing that is very strange about this reconstruction. So in fact, contrary to Birkenmeier's claim, rather than arguing for an equivalence, what Grosse test does, assuming that we, have, you know, we accept this representation in terms of the sums, is to argue that the sum of the natural numbers is strictly greater than the sum of the even numbers on account of the fact that the sum of the natural numbers exceeds that of the even numbers by the odd numbers. Because the odd numbers are greater than zero. So it gets the inequality, but only in one direction. There's no equivalence claim. Concerning claim C, um, okay, which is that uh, the sum of the even numbers is two times the sum of the natural numbers. And then the same thing for triples and so on. Concerning claim C, it is one possible interpretation of what Gressetes is saying, which is the one that uses arithmetical progressions, although there are alternative interpretations based on geometrical progressions, like the one we saw in Mao, and also in the most influential interpretation of what is going on with Gressetes, which is that of Cecilia Panti, who's a specialist of the, the Lucha. Uh, so in this other interpretation, uh, uh, sorry, in this interpretation by Birkenmeier, then, omnium numerorum ad unitate continuum duplorum means just the even numbers. So the arithmetical sequence. Okay. Uh, now, what is very surprising about Birkenmeier is that it doesn't point out that a formal contradiction immediately follows just from B and C. Because um, and from something that Grosser test obviously holds. In fact, if you have C, you have that the summation of the even numbers is two times the summation of the natural numbers. Well, then you obtain immediately that the summation of the natural numbers is different from zero. Uh, that is a fact. And so you get that the summation of the even numbers is greater than the summation of the natural numbers. But then from B, we know that there is this equivalence postulated by Birkenmeier, so that if sigma n is greater than sigma 2n, that is if and only if the uh, difference between the natural numbers and the even numbers is just the odd numbers. But Grosset test holds the right hand side <laughs> of that equivalence. So if you were holding the equivalence, it could infer 
that left hand side and got that sigma n minus sigma 2n equals the odd numbers. And so it would follow that the sum of the natural numbers is greater than the sum of the even numbers. But we also have that the sum of the even numbers is greater, strictly greater, than the sum of the natural numbers. And we have two contradictory claims here in these two claims. So if you're a historian looking at this, you have to say, well, either Grosset was a really poor mathematician, or you know, there is something that is going wrong with this interpretation. Can't be this wrong. We have enough textual evidence here to immediately say that Grosset is not holding that equivalence that Birkin Meyer is attributing to him. It's nowhere in the text. If you look at the text I gave you, which contains the passages, there is no claim of equivalence. Now, James McEvoy follows exactly on the same footsteps as Birkenmeyer. So same type of interpretation, arithmetical sequences, that phrase, uh, right, abonitante uh, continuum duplorum means the even numbers. Uh, and then he has a slightly different parsing of the claims, despite the fact that he's saying, I'm following Birkenmeyer. So the slightly different thing on points two and three, which are the ones that are relevant for what I'm saying, is that, um, first of all, he's saying that the sum of all the numbers is the infinite. And now we get this new claim that is nowhere in the text, that and double the sum of all even numbers. Well, that's not in process. You know, that the natural number should be exactly double the sum of the natural numbers. So that's already a problem in that it's not in the text. And then uh, when it gets to three, so, um, so in place of that equivalence that Burke and Meyer had, which we saw was textually inadequate, we have now this other claim, which is also textually inadequate because this claim is not in Grosset's. And then finally, again, the arithmetical interpretation, which is the sum of all double numbers from one to infinity is twice the sum of the halves corresponding to those doubles, and the sum of all treble numbers is three times the sum and so on. Okay, also from this interpretation, you can get immediately a contradiction, just as in the other one. So again, you're in this bind, is it, you know, is it the interpretation that doesn't work, or is it uh, that gross attacks was such a poor thinker that he didn't see the trouble he was getting in? So in the interest of time, I'm going to be a little quicker here. So let's summarize the situation. Both Birk and Meyer's interpretation and making boys lead to an inconsistent theory, but for different reasons. Since both agree on taking on board the equality that the sum of the even numbers is twice the sum of the natural numbers, and those are claims seen in Becker-Meyer and three in Mekivoy, the difference comes at the level of B in Birkenmeyer and two in Mekivoy. <coughs> in Becker-Meyer's case, the contradiction is generated by ascribing to Grosset as the equivalence B, we have seen, and the fact that one could infer the left hand side of the equivalence using Grosset as explicit commitment to the right hand side. In the case of Mekivoy, the contradiction is generated by assuming in B that the sum of the even numbers is equal to the sum of the odd numbers, because that was the claim about twice the sum of the even numbers equals the sum of the natural numbers. Okay. <coughs> So this reading, as I said, reads only numerorum abonitate continuum duplorum as referring to the even numbers. So how does it work? Well, I guess, you know, you have this abonitate. You start from uh, taking as reference the series of the natural numbers from unity, 1 plus 2 plus 3, and so on. And then you double each term of the series to obtain 2 plus 4 plus 6, and so on. So in this interpretation, this abunitate has a very natural interpretation as, you know, it's the start of the reference line on which you then multiply by two every single time. Now, what are then the ways to get out of this trouble? Well, um, you can block premise B and premise 2 in the interpretations, or you can also block the one that uses the arithmetical progression as the right way to interpret Grosset. You could say, no, it's not talking about the even numbers. 
He's talking about something else. <laughs> and Panty, in fact, in our work, rejects this interpretation in terms of arithmetical progressions and sides for an interpretation in which what's going on is that the series that Grosset test is talking about are geometrical progressions. Okay, um, now there are many aspects of Panty's interpretation and I discuss, I discuss all of them in this book I mentioned on the emergence of mathematical infinity in the Latin Middle Ages, which is forthcoming for Oxford University Press. Here, I will simply limit myself to the interpretation of this passage, Omnium numerorum ab unitate continuo duplorum. So according to her interpretation, the passage indicates that one takes the double of the preceding number starting from unity. So in other words, what you're generating is a series of powers of two, which starts from one. And so you get one plus two plus four plus eight, and so on. So now we have two possibilities, as I said, about reading these passages of process test, the Birk and Meyer make it boy with arithmetical progressions, and follow pan or follow panty with geometrical progressions. But there are problems with the Panty reading. Because uh, the, uh, already as Panty points out, uh, the existence of ratios among infinities follows under each one of the two interpretations. Okay, so that's not an issue. But, first of all, she wants to claim there is a linguistic contrast, you know, in uh, uh, giving advantage to her interpretation between the passages where Grossetes speaks of numeritares and the one, the present one, where he speaks of numeri ab unitate continui duplica. It's a very different type of syntactical construction that he's using there. And so why use the more complicated construction if it's the said numeri pares? That's one argument. But there is a further problem, much more serious, <coughs> um, which consists in the interpretation of ab unitate. Because she says, if cross a test <coughs> is intended to indicate the multiples of two, i.e. the even numbers, we should exclude unity from which the series begins. So why this abunitate if we want two, four, uh, six, and so on, oh, sorry, uh, six and so on. And finally, she was very perceptive in pointing out that in the Birk and Meyer and making for interpretation, you immediately get a contradiction. And so Charity, hermeneutical charity, recommends finding an interpretation that keeps the theory consistent. Um, how much time do I have to give you? Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> then you, what you're going to get is the summary, and you're going to send me a nice email saying, you know, I see the slides. Um, so the, the story here is how we're going to, you know, find a solution to a problem like this. And my solution was, well, um, Panty got stuck because she basically could not really interpret this ab unitate in a satisfactory way. The reason is that Rosetta says many things about taking the subdoubles of this series. And if you take the subdoubles of this series, you have to divide one by two. And you end up with one half plus one, and you know, kind of rational numbers of that sort, fractional numbers, do not belong to this kind of arithmetical stuff. Then she had another interpretation that was even worse, and she knows it, because it made, you know, after the division by two, it made the two, the two series completely identical. So, uh, how to get out of this? Well, my thought was, we have to see whether it's possible to find interpretation of this abunitate in such a way that the ab unitate is not taken to be part of the series that is being generated. And I go through all the Euclid, uh, all the Latin Euclids, uh, to see what they said in the arithmetical books about various theorems that have to do with the generation of perfect numbers. Uh, because when you're generating perfect numbers, it's a wonderful theorem by Euclid that tells you how to use this kind of series of powers of two to generate perfect numbers. So I'm going to go now straight to the, uh, so you had a lot of stuff here <laughs> that we're going to have to see. 
Um, so um, Herman of Carinthia gets very close to the way of speaking that um, Grossetes is used. This is 938. It says, if the numbers generated without break in double proportion, starting from unity, huh? and then look, what does it list? It says 2, 4, <laughs> 8, and so on. So starting from unity doesn't mean that 1 is to be included in the series. And there are plenty of such theorems in Euclid where you get this, um, geometrical proportions where they speak in this way. Start from unity, but then when you look at the sequence they're generating, unity is not there. And so I claim that this gives us a very natural interpretation because, you know, it's kind of a simple-minded thought that Grosset has. Take that series of natural numbers, uh, and if you multiply each atom by two, thereby getting the, um, sorry, if you then have a, a correspondence with powers of two, as he is postulating, uh, then you're going to get exactly this, uh, this type of phenomenon. Uh, and uh, so I suggest then to conclude that something similar is happening to gross attacks with the sequence of numeric duplicates. One is not a numerous nucleus, it is, for it is not an even number, but it is the generator of the sequence of the numeric duplicate, and so it plays the role in defining the sequence while it is not probably <coughs> contained in the set that are being defined. So the specification of unitate in Grosset's description can be explained in this way, so that the series in question that is really talking about is 2 plus 4 plus 8, so the powers of 2. The advantage of this proposal is that no fractional numbers appear when it takes the sub-doubles uh, of such series, uh, or as in the worst, other worst case where you ended up with the same series once you took the sub-doubles. Then there would be no hierarchy of infinites because you have the same series which you're working with. So, and the proposal is the advantage of simplicity. The first series is double the second, because each corresponding addendum of the second is twice as large as the corresponding addendum, addendum to the first. Uh, okay, so let's see. Um, last slide, I conclude. Um, so I find that this is a more satisfactory reading. It's also the simple-minded reading, but it took us a lot of work because you have to get rid of the older readings, um, but it doesn't remove all the tensions from Grossatet's pioneering efforts on mathematical infinity, where two intuitions, part whole and correspondence, uh, lead to a house divided against itself. I conclude remarking that this instability displayed by Grossatet's is only to be expected. Grosset has started to explore a terra incognita in which there were dangers lying around at every step. But whereas others would have fe feared to thread into this territory, he forged, he forged ahead with courage. Thank you very much.